like to call this work, uh, work study session to order in the, for independent school district 624. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Arkans? Here. Lloyd? Here. Chapman? Here. Ellison? Here. Mullen? Here. The master? Here. Thompson? Here. All right. Uh, I'd like to go to our first uh, discussion item B1 uh, school presentation, Lincoln and Central Middle School. Thank you. Thanks, Board Chair Mullen, and school board members, Superintendent Kazmichek, and uh, Mr. Collins for the opportunity for us to talk a little bit about Lincoln Elementary. I'm real excited about coming after the bond approval because is this official now? The gym is actually going to occur <laughs> at Lincoln. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> it's now official. Uh, it's been something in the works for a while, and we can't thank the community enough for the opportunity to put an addition onto Lincoln School. Uh, I'm here today uh, with uh, my colleagues, uh, people who are in the trenches every day. They do a wonderful job and they're, and they're willing to come outside of their comfort zone and talk with you this evening. I have <coughs> Teresa Ogden, a fourth grade teacher at Lincoln Elementary, and then obviously Alex Kornbaum, who teaches first grade also at that point, which is uh, wonderful for them to take two different topics of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Lincoln Elementary, if you don't know about the school, it's uh, a K-5 school. It has about 475 students. Uh, we're really proud to host, out of all the special ed programs that are available, also a uh, EBD cluster program for setting two and three students. Um, it's just been remarkable what that program's been offering to families. In addition to that, we also house the gifted and talented area, the Explorations Program, which is a multi-age program that has uh, three classrooms within the building. And then just recently we've uh, been honored and humbly uh, appreciate the honor of being a national board, uh, national school, rib blue ribbon school award um, recipient. And that is not done just with one or two individuals, that's done collectively through the help of the district, through the help of the community, the parent support group, and a really strong dedicated staff. <coughs> So uh, that's been an exciting thing to celebrate this year. So um, if you look forward into our mission statement at Lincoln Elementary, you can see it's divided into three parts. You have the purpose, which is in yellow, and then you also move into, uh, or the identity is in yellow, the purpose is in the blue, and then the att attributes are in the bullet points right there. Uh, we really uh, are excited about being an empowered environment of learners and also the other part of igniting curiosity obviously inspiring students and unlocking their potential is really important to us just as I'm sure it is in every school and you can read the other bullets about how we plan on doing that through that strategic planning process it's a very exciting time to do that um, there's really two major tactics that came out of that two major uh, action plans and the first one really focused on nurturing the whole child to a personalized learning experience. And instead of having all four plans laid out there, it, like we're just summarizing three key points. Uh, one is the student-driven choice point in which we really embrace the, the makerspace concept within our school setting. It's still in the emphasis stage, but I know that uh, many of the grade levels and the programs are trying to dabble with that makerspace concept. And I know with the district support of bringing in a mobile makerspace uh, lab, that's been helpful too. Uh, we also have a concept under student driven choice called Genius Hour and some of the grade levels just allow kids to kind of create and design their own projects or their own initiatives in which they try to think about what they can do to help better the school or the community at large or just to try to solve a challenging problem and then to celebrate that by displaying it at the end. Um, in the real world, real world experiences, uh, a couple things fall into place because of our location at Lincoln, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump from here. Uh, we are able to do some walking field trips to downtown White Bear and just really uh, appreciate what the community of White Bear Lake has to offer around Lincoln Elementary. And then as you can see in the photo, we also like to do some service learning projects. Uh, in the fall, we do um, the leaf raking project, which um, supports about 20 neighbors that are close by within a 10 minute walking distance of our school. Uh, we've been doing that for a few years. Uh, typically, it's been after school, but going through the strategic planning process and thinking more of it through an equity lens, we realized that there were a number of families and students that weren't able to take advantage of that. 
So this past year, we did it for the first time as a whole school during the school day. And Leah uh, Sitka, a fifth grade teacher, took on that initiative. And we had four major groups going out at, in 90 minute blocks uh, throughout the day, uh, including kindergarten. And that was amazing to see all that take place. It just took over the neighborhood. And it was a lot of fun. The kids, the leaves came down at just the right time. So they just had a, a great time with it all. Um, and then in addition to that, we obviously do a winter service project, which uh, many of you have heard from other schools. And you create these uh, fleece blankets for single parents. Um, we also work with uh, Meals on Wheels and provide some just little care packages. And then in this, we also connect with the Serenity Care Center close by, and we do some walking trips over to Serenity Care and interact with the, with the citizens over there, the residents over there. And then the last piece of this tactic uh, is really about pers purposeful movement. Um, right now, we're really focusing on the social and emotional needs of the child within the school setting and our district setting. Uh, one of the ways that their needs need to be met is just to get out of that classroom and just to get some fresh air. And there was the Big Sleuth initiative that took place last year, which was pretty exciting. And John Barnes, a teacher from Otter Lake, and Mary Malloy, a teacher from Hugo, uh, said, hey, let's try to figure out a way to do extra recess. So we piloted it last year in May. We did about a week. We <coughs> figured out where the bugs were going to be in trying that. We started it up this fall. Uh, we tried to do some grade levels with two extra recesses and some with one. We came to a conclusion that one was the best, and we really focused on when that 15-minute break is going to occur so it's not at the very beginning of the day or the very end of the day or right before or after lunch and recess or right around specialists. So we're trying to find that sweet spot for it, and it's working out wonderfully. The kids really enjoy it, and trying to keep it to that 15-minute time is just enough that they need that they can come back re-energized and kind of focus for learning some more. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what Tactic 1 is about. There's obviously more to it than that, but that hopefully that gives you a little glimpse into that plan. If we, as we move into uh, the next tactic, which is Tactic 2, um, it's talking about creating a connected culture, and Teresa wasn't even voluntold to come here today. She actually <laughs> volunteered to come in and talk about our, our book study doing as an entire staff. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa to talk about our White Fragility book study. Yeah. So we've been, as a staff, reading um, Light Fragility, and just going to give you a little bit of a backstory of how we got to the point of, of participating and choosing this as a way to sort of think about a connected culture and building those diverse perspectives um, between our staff as well as reaching out and having that filter into our students. Um, so Alex and I and a few other teachers are on the leadership team, so we meet with Dan about once a month. So last spring, um, we were talking about these tactics and what would our approach be? How do we envision connecting more culturally as a school? And so we brainstormed several different options and thought about um, possibilities and then through that we decided that we really need a starting point as a staff so that we all had a common understanding we had a, a foundation from which we could build upon and it's then that we looked at some different book titles and options and came um, to the decision that we'd move forward with re reading white fragility and so um, with this reading of the book um, we have read um, the first few chapters and it really is kind of a listen, share, and discuss format. Um, the neat part about the book study is that we meet in triads, and so there's cross-grade level teams of teachers that are part of the discussions. So on the team that I'm on, there's a fifth grade teacher as well as a second grade teacher. And then in addition to our triads, we have other um, support staff. Um, that will join our discussions as well. So the last discussion that it was part of, our school psychologist was part of it, as well as a paraprofessional. So to really think about the different perspectives and um, the piece that we were really careful about as a team is rather than jumping right into these sort of conversations that need to have courage and that we need to be careful about how we're starting an initiative like this we really just did some getting to know you things so for me to get some insight on the background of some of my staff members that i didn't know before that went back to their childhood or some of their experiences in their own um, school 
uh, settings, so both elementary and high school. So it was really intentional on the team's part to think about how do we create the safe environment to build this trust and relationship before we start reading a book that gets pretty intense and gets into some pretty deep concepts and um, and ideas. So that's kind of how our um, book study has been going. Um, we'll continue to move through the book. The book is structured basically in two parts. So the author addresses white fragility and um, just to give you a concept of of the perspective of white fragility. It really is kind of addressing those defensive actions or fear, guilt, anger um, that people might choose to argue or defend or possibly just choose to be silent about. And so that element of culture and how it's discussed or addressed is kind of laid out. And as you can see, the big topics that are sort of defined and addressed and making sure everyone has a common understanding of the concepts is how the book starts. And then that's tied with how, with that white fragility, how is that pro protecting racial inequality? So because of that fear, that guilt, that anger, those arguments, that silence, how is that then leading to the inequality that we continue to see from a racial standpoint? So that's the first part of the book. And then the second part is, so now that we have this foundational understanding, what can be done so that we can engage more effectively in conversations as teachers, educators, um, people in the community, you know, how with this knowledge can we then take something that has been either silenced or argued and have courteous, courageous conversations where we're listening, sharing, and having discussions. Um, so when I think about that as a teacher and I think about what the book does for me, I just think about the different perspectives that I can see and I can consider. Um, I also think about the insight that it gives me as well as just that continuous reminder that we all have biases and so to be aware of that. It's not anything that any of us can avoid. So just that understanding and just that awareness of it. And then just thinking about my voice and the other voices that I need to listen to to really think about equity and thinking about um, connecting um, more so from a cultural perspective. So that's kind of where I'm at as an educator. And then in turn, it leads me to think about, well, what does that mean for my students? And so I'm really excited about the second step curriculum that we've started to implement now. And so if um, you're not familiar with the curriculum, it really is a curriculum that focuses on the social, emotional, and academic success of our learners. And so in the curriculum that I've been teaching so far, our first lessons were on respect and empathy. So when you think about respect and empathy and you think about culture and you think about equality and equity and these elements, knowing that you have that um, and you're building that foundation. And then after that, thinking about how to listen attentively and then the difference between passive behaviors, aggressive behaviors and assertive behaviors. So really setting the stage and creating an environment to have discussions and to be respectful of each other. And so with that, helping my students and the students in our school figure out who are they, what is their identity, and feeling comfortable to share that story, to give voice to who they are, and to respectfully listen, discuss, and be willing to share your story as well is what's really exciting to me when I think about these bigger topics and um, equity elements um, that we need to consider in our classroom. So moving forward as a building, um, one of the big things that we're really thinking about is the district's um, equity commitment. So really thinking about the decision-making protocol, the four questions the district is asking us to ask as educators and members of, of our school community. So thinking when I'm making decisions as a teacher, when I think about having a discussion in my class, how wonderful to take these and have my students be mindful of what to consider, what to ask, um, what decisions you can make when you're thinking about understanding others, the culture they come from, and then really just thinking about how to be equitable, 
equitable um, in our classroom setting, in our setting, our school, and throughout our community. So it's really exciting when I think about all the pieces and all the elements and how it can all tie together as we move forward from just starting to talk about race, but obviously beyond race. We have so many other elements that we need to have discussions about and be respectful listeners and um, to let people share their stories and have a voice in that. So. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah. yeah, and it's been interesting to watch the journey of trust that's occurring within the staff from the start of the year to where we're at now. I'm very proud of the staff for some of the conversations that are starting to occur now in the last few meetings. Uh, we're gonna move forward Mr. with- Schmidt, if you can, I just wanna, I want to make sure that if there's any questions that we can ask them real quick if you don't mind. I don't have a problem. Is there any yeah. questions? Anybody? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our, our next stage is, and the final stage that we'd like to celebrate is Alex will share a little bit about the Ron Clark Academy. Uh, this tactic team really looked at a way to take all that's exciting within Lincoln School and see if we can hone it in with a common theme or a purpose or focus. And so I'm going to turn it over to her. Right. So last summer I had the opportunity to go to the Ron Clark Academy in Atlanta, Georgia through a grassroots grant. The Ron Clark Academy is known worldwide for its innovation and its student engagement. When I was there I was able to learn about the house system and Ron Clark developed the house system. Well, he didn't necessarily develop it. It was happening in Europe for a long time before now. He, he creatively tweaked the idea and now he teaches educators all over the country and all over the world how to use it in their schools. How the house system works is essentially a house is a team, just another word for a team, and there's one of four, a student or a staff members um, placed into one of four houses. Amistad is the house of friendship and kindness. Isabindi is the house of courage. River is the house of dreamers and passion. And altruismo is the house of um, empowering others and givers, which ironically we are all in the same house of altruismo. Um, these houses meet throughout the school year and they talk about character education and they do community building activities. Students also have the chance to earn points for their house by showing excellence in character. We spend this year educating staff about the house system and then in the fall we will be um, teaching it to the staff and any incoming new staff members. Then I also, I just wanted to note that the reason that we're doing this is all about the connected culture. When I was at RCA, there was just something different that was happening there. And when I looked at what they're doing and what we're doing, we already have a strong sense of community at Lincoln. I really feel like this health system will help us to be able to play off of that strength of community. It's a chance to give kids a, a chance to, um, Sorry, connect with others across classes, across grade levels that they might not interact with during the school day. And it also helps them to gain more friendship. So we're building off of that strength of a community at Lincoln. I've used the house system in my classroom this year, just, with, just in one first grade classroom, and I've seen the impacts of it already. Even today, we were doing a closing circle and we were sharing the, the best part about our day, and more than half of the kids said, doing our house cheers or meeting with my house it was so important to them that they have this time to connect at a deeper level with just a few students um, in our class. So I can't wait to see what the impact is like school-wide if it's already making such an impact in one classroom. Thanks, Alex. And it's one of those examples where the White Bear Lake Area uh, Education Foundation has the classroom grants, and Alex took advantage of that, went to the Ron Clark Academy, and was able to bring it back to the building level strategic planning process, and the timing just worked out wonderfully and everyone embraced that through the process. So we thank her for her leadership and Teresa's leadership on the equity initiative and we open it up now to any questions that you may have. Any questions? I just, oh, go, go ahead and just talk I just thought of one. Um, well, I was just at Lincoln for the read around. I would just yeah, like thank to you, add that. By the way. I went to school there and I'm very happy you're getting a new gym because it's exactly <laughs> the same as it was when I went there and that may have been a little while ago. Um, <laughs> As far as the staff that's involved, does this also include office staff, custodial staff, and like the um, uh, staff that works in the cafeteria as well? How so far do we In regards to the Ron Clark Academy, or uh, just the whole thing? I'm yeah, really well, probably more the, the book and stuff. Yeah, so with, with the White Fragility Book Study, I personally went to all 
roles within the school and said you are welcome to do it. We talked about how they, if there was a need for them to get compensated, how we would do that. And so I was impressed with the number of support staff that are able to attend, but obviously we also have some of the duties that they're responsible for mm -hmm. when we have the book study. Yeah. And so we just try to keep everyone up to speed through uh, weekly updates. I do a weekly blog for the staff. And hopefully if they're reading that, you know, we'll keep up to speed. And then with the uh, Ron Clark Academy, uh, uh, Alex has taken great uh, pains to just make sure she's connected with everybody so that they're included to be a part of the house and, and what, they, what their role could be even if there's other responsibilities and that, that might pull them away from it. So yes, we're still working through it, but everyone is involved okay. as best we can. Is it okay if I add a yeah, little please. bit? So, yeah, please. Um, even like our custodian, Miss Gale and Mr. Jim, they, they all have a house, so right now, this year, every staff member has been sorted into a house. We had a little kickoff party. Um, one of our service learning projects, we even worked together as our house to prepare the, to, you know, the no, no so tie blankets. Um, and in the future, next year, there will be people in charge of leading those character education topics with our house. And even um, we're hoping, like Miss Janine, our, our lunch lady, will be in those, um, Mrs. Kendall, our secretary, everyone will be a part of those meetings. And the purpose of that is so that each child doesn't just have one classroom teacher that they can go to, but when they go throughout the school, they see a multitude of, of adults that they feel comfortable talking with and have a relationship with. That's great, thank you. I just wanna thank you all for your work. This is great, thank you for the update. We really appreciate your, your work goes both ways. Thank you for the partnership. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. So, Ms. Peterson is for Central. Welcome. Thank you. I believe my voice will bear with me. Um, Chair Mullen, school board. Uh, district leadership, student leaders. Uh, thank you for inviting me to come today. Uh, I'm really excited just to talk about some of the highlights that we uh, have at Central this year. Um, and really decided to just stay focused on what I said at the very beginning of the year. As a new person to the district, new person um, to the building, really taking time to build community and to build culture while also moving things forward, but keeping that at the center. Um, as I keep reminding my staff that this is a um, marathon, it's not a sprint. We're in February. I'm a 5K runner, I'm gonna be honest. Like a good three miles is good for me. So we're at about mile 15 right now, and we all really, really need each other. And we need to be cheerleaders for each other, and we need to keep lifting each other up. Um, so I'm gonna go through our strategic plan. Uh, same piece, our biggest emphasis this year is that we've really been talking a lot about understanding and embracing differences. And as a leader, I said that really has to start with us as the adults. As the adults in this building, we are the leaders. We are the ones who develop the community and the culture. And we really have to understand and know each other. Um, and so we spent some time at the very beginning of the year um, just focusing on getting to know each other, learning from each other, um, building relationships, uh, two out of the three people on our admin team, our dean, is also new. So just taking that time to observe, to say what currently exists, who are the people that are here. Um, entering into those situations, really focusing on using positive language and problem solving, rather than saying um, when we're talking with kids about punishment or talking with each other about sort of like the what ifs and how do we handle this? How do we problem solve together? Um, through the whole process, one of the best things that we did at the beginning of the year is we all stood in a huge circle workshop week down here by decade of when people started at Central. And it was fascinating because I was brand new and Amber who was our dean was brand new. And then Bob Brewer, who's my associate principal, was at the opposite end. And we went through and they, we created an image of what's happened in this school over the last 27 years. Because that's sort of the years of service within this building. And what were the highlights and what were the things that we want to bring back. 
And from that, what I found was that's where the staff really got to know each other. And so they recognized, wow, those are the things that happened. That's what that room used to be used for. So like all of these other little stories that happened. And it broke down a lot of barriers. Because over the summer, I had, I had a lot of teachers step in and say, gosh, you know what? I just don't know people like I used to know people. Um, and, and the strategic plan, not only from the district, but from the school, is what sold me on coming to this district. But there's a lot of heavy lifting when we're talking about equity, and we're talking about race, and we're talking about changing grading policies. And so I wanted to really take time to build and to know each other. A um, few other things that we have done along the way, just positive postcards out to families, as well as staff shout outs on postcards every single week. Um, the staff themselves created a social committee, and it's a social committee where we have done things like chili cook-offs or frosting valentine cookies during lunch. Um, just little things during the day that people can pause and have fun and get to know each other a little bit better. Um, in addition, there is a link. I had no intention of showing the video. I should have said that to Marissa, but I put it in so if at any point you are interested in seeing it, it's one of a couple videos that we're creating, and I would give a um, huge shout out to Heather Schmidt, who is our instructional coach, and she started the year by just going and talking to people to say, what is central? We've also done one on grades. Um, we have another one that's in the works with the possibility now of some kids actually doing the editing and things on that as well. Which leads us right into student voice. Um, huge emphasis on student voice. So as adults, as we get to know each other, at the end of the day, it's the students that we serve. Um, and I think it's a balance between the adults have lots of ideas of things that work really well. Students have lots of feedback to be able to give to us, but they're also really creative and they know what they need. Um, and so I actually started with the kids who are in our reading intervention classes and just went into those classes and said, how's it going? Tell me what you like. Tell me what's working. Tell me what's not working. And I intentionally started with the kids in the reading intervention classes as opposed to the classes um, where we have kids who are involved in um, student council or NJHS. Um, or web because their voices are present in the school. And sometimes it's the kids in our intervention classes that we don't hear. And from there, they gave us so many ideas. They said, we have so many ideas for how we can make the cafeteria better and different things. And is there a way for us to get outside? And from there, Mrs. Walsh met with them and we're working on some plans to be able to be outside in the spring. Um, they came up and I just met with them. They have fantastic ideas for what to do with bear time next year. And by the way, none of them said, hey, it's because we want to wear hats, or we want to have our phones, or we just want to hang out. They talked about things like, we need access to get extra help with homework. Sometimes we really feel like we need to move. One girl said, is there ever a time when we could just study something we're interested in and we don't have to worry about having a grade for it? <laughs> I was like, yes, that would be fantastic. Um, they talked about needs for mental health and for support, and how do we handle social media? Um, all of those things. And these were kids that were in seventh grade. And I chose the seventh graders because I said, I need you to be the leaders next year when we do this, because you're the ones who are gonna be here. So I gathered their information. I'm gonna go back in the next week or two and put together some different proposals for them to gather some other feedback. A few other things we've been doing, I love to read month, it's from our literacy committee, all student driven, all of the activities all month. Um, some teachers pulled that together. We had some students who came to me and said, what else can we do for Black History Month? And they've put together slides that we have um, in our announcements and on our TV screens. Uh, they started a kindness challenge, things like that. So it's been um, really fun getting to know the kids that way. Literacy at the middle school, not a surprise with the other meetings that I've been at, has been a huge focus this year um, with all of the change to our middle school schedule. Um, looking at readers workshop, but also lots of conversations around um, inclusion and how do we actually open up our schedule and paths so that students have more opportunities to interact with each other as opposed to being tracked into different classes and how can different teachers work together so that students who have um, similar interests, sometimes they can mix and match um, within their classrooms, within different groups, different ideas. Um, that they have as well. Um, and then also looking at the planning for next year. Um, we spent quite a bit of time with uh, Sunrise Park Middle School 
um, language arts teachers, and it was a fantastic day that we had together. And just really fun to see the barriers break down and have all of the seventh grade language arts teachers together really talking and sharing about what are the best things that um, have happened. What are the things that we still really need help with? What are all of the questions that we have? <coughs> um, the image here is of a uh, butterfly, and this was part of the student-driven piece for literacy, as they said, reading gives you your wings. And so every student in the school was given a butterfly, and they're all over, and they have written um, the titles of their favorite books. And so it was interesting with the literacy committee navigating kind of sixth grade ideas of what would be really cool to do versus eighth grade ideas of what would be really cool to do. And so the language arts class actually this week is doing a Google <coughs> base, which I know has been done at the high school and they're doing it through language arts kind of with the scavenger hunt um, around literacy and culture. And then finally, um, I started the year, you know, really saying we're gonna get to know each other and we have to know each other to do this heavy lifting. Um, and yet I told my staff I lead with my heart and I will share with you, my staff, who I am this year. Um, and we're gonna continue to have these conversations. And so we have been talking a lot about equity. We've been talking about race. We have been talking about mental health. Some of the things um, that we've done is we showed angst, which is all about anxiety. Teachers had just, I, I unfortunately was not able to be at that session, but had aha moments of like, now I get why this child is doing this. Kind of one of my favorite sayings is that, is that giving you a hard time? He's having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the teachers kind of had this aha moment and it was just enough there that now they want more information. Um, and so I'm working with some of our special education teachers um, where we have done some work already to support, but then going forward um, this spring and into the fall. We've talked about being warm demanders because in middle school, behavior is a thing. And so how, how, how do we become warm demanders for our students? And then I've shared a lot with my staff of like, hey, this is a book I've read that I really loved. Or you know what? I was listening to this podcast. <coughs> and I actually listened to a podcast with Robin D'Angelo and I, I was talking to my staff. I said, I had to listen to it twice. I've now listened to it three times. Putting myself out to be vulnerable for them to say, I found myself being defensive and I went back, but it made me pause and think, here's something else that we could do. Um, and it has been fascinating now, the people that are coming and sharing. And so um, a couple of different teachers who have picked up the book, White Fragility, we've started an equity committee with just the purpose of learning and talking together. Um, another teacher who said, it really made me think about that podcast. She said, so I went and bought Critical Race Theory. And I went, hmm, that wouldn't have been where I probably would have started. But she's like, I can't <laughs> deny it. It's all true, and I need to talk to you about it. And so just kind of creating this momentum and energy. Um, and then my job, I always see, is how do I remove bar barriers and connect people together within the staff? Um, and people are anxious, and I keep saying, yep, or maybe excited and anxious. Yes, let's keep working together and know that all of these things are going to come into play, um, and we're moving forward. So we've, we have... Um, We've done a lot. I just have to say thank you. It is a fantastic community. The teachers have welcomed me with open arms, as have the students um, and the families. I have heard that it feels tangibly different. I don't know any different. I just know that when I'm there, most of the time, it feels really good. So if 90% of the time it, it feels good, I feel like we're doing something right. And nobody's going to be happy 100% um, of the time. So those are kind of the highlights of of things that we're at and that we're focusing on. Questions, comments, concerns? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your Thank work. Thank you. Thank you. It's a Appreciate pleasure. Appreciate it. All right. We will uh, now move into our second uh, discussion item, B2, which is the American Indian Parent Advisory Update. Is that Ms. Paul or Dr. Gillespie? It's, it's me. Um, so I'd like to introduce Jordan Zickerman. She's our American Native American um, cultural liaison and oversees our Indian education program. And she's here to provide an update for everyone. Bonjour, Dr. Kazmichik, Chair Mullen. It's 
members of the board, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, the purpose of me being here today is I'm going to provide a quick update regarding some of the work that's been going on this year regarding our Indian education program. And then on the March 2nd meeting, Andrew Adams, the chairperson of the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee, will be presenting the resolution vote of concurrence to the board. But I wanted to provide some background information regarding all the work that's been shared with um, the parent committee that has helped them uh, guide their decision. Oh, I got two computers going. Okay, and this, I will start by saying, is the same um, presentation that I've been sharing with the APAC on a monthly basis. Um, so I'll start with February. Um, the first ever student leadership cohort at Sunrise Park Middle School has started, and this was a result of um, different leadership and team members attending the Urban Leadership Academy, where we heard about an initiative called the Story Squad which was basically a different platform for students to share their story and how it interacts or what the different intersectionalities are between school and their home life. And this story squad, they presented, um, students presented and crafted their stories through many different mediums, whether that be a YouTube video, graphics, um, spoken word, a poem, or completely anonymous, all of the above. It's really up to the student to craft and create their own story. And uh, we partnered with Matt Manier at Sunrise Park and all of the cultural liaisons are involved in this and we created a, the first ever cohort of students to participate in something like a story squad. We don't know exactly what that looks like yet. We just knew it was a good idea for our students to share their stories and we brought it at, back to Sunrise during advisory time to create a platform and see what do our students think of this idea and how can we tweak it to fit here. So we're still in the early phases of that, but we have four indigenous students who are participating in that and we're really excited to see how it pulls out through the end of the year. And we have discussed potentially adding that as a concept where maybe all eighth graders do it. We don't know yet. We're really just trying to feel out the students and what they think of this concept. So we're really excited about it. Um, in our elementary groups and in our middle school groups for, we call them Indian Ed Clubs, um, we have been learning about the seven grandfather teachings. I did bring a little booklet. It's kind of just what we've been drawing in in elementary this year of all of our different, the seven grandfather teachings and et cetera, which has been really fun. And I do have a picture of that later so you guys can see it more close, but I can pass it around too if you like. Um, also in February, the Dream of Wild Health came to South Campus for a Many Faces event. I'm sure you have all heard of the Many Faces initiative now in White Bear. It's an awesome, awesome initiative that started, I believe, last year. And they very well incorporated the APAC last year. And I'm super happy that we've continued that collaboration this year. And we offered it during the school day. So it was really fun to get our community interacting with our students to talk about an indigenous farm that we have right here in our community. So that was really great. Mm -hmm. In pictures, so that's kind of the word books that I, I have right here. And one picture I also added in late that I have to shout out two of our students, uh, Kellen and Helen from Onika had perfect attendance this year. So, or for this month. So we, I added that picture in, but I added in late, but I had to shout them out because it was super fun. And they had a pancake breakfast, which they were super proud about, so. January, so I'm gonna go through to November. So this, we won't do the whole duration of the year, but middle school clubs focus on relationship building as a theme for the month. We did the step into the circle activity. Um, it kind of reminds me of Freedom Riders. If you've seen that movie where the students would step to the line if this was applicable to them. So we did a step into the circle activity and it was really good and it, it created a lot of really good and healthy conversation. One of my favorite takeaways though was one of the questions was step into the circle if you're bilingual. And one of the students who has been involved in our Indian Ed programming since she attended Birch 
And um, she stepped into the, the circle and I said, what, what languages do you speak? And she said, English and Ojibwe. I said, where did you learn Ojibwe? She said, you taught me how to say my name at Birch. <laughs> I said, that's a win. That is a win. You are bilingual, you're right. <laughs> so that was just a really fun takeaway that I'm happy our students have that opportunity. Um, through student feedback, in regards to Central in particular, we have identified that meeting in the boardroom is much better than us meeting in the commons. We have a big group. Our central group, it varies because it's up to student choice. Every, every native student gets a pass to come, but they don't have to come. So it's up to them. And when we meet in the common spaces, sometimes we'll have like 35 students. That's a really large group. And especially with the, the overhead hallway and the hallway right there, it's like, hi, I'm in Indian Ed Club. So trying to manage that classroom management was getting difficult for me. But also I noticed that it was starting to throw off our engagement a little bit. So I started meeting in here and we went back and forth. And then we had an open conversation about it, like, which do you prefer? So there are some times with, that we'll still meet in the common space, especially when we're not trying to get so deep. There's perfect opportunities for the commons for us, but there's also really good opportunities for us in the boardroom. So it's nice to be able to have that flexibility. <coughs> and our students also think that it's so cool to be in the boardroom. So they <laughs> love that. <laughs> um, in January as well, three Native students participated in a student panel regarding um, the future of learning at White Bear Lake, which was really exciting for them. It was a really big crowd too. So a lot of the three of the, two of the students, one was Miss Jennifer Adams, Two of the other students um, were middle school students too. So it was a really large group for them and they were kind of like a little intimidated, but after they opened up and the way that the event was set up for the students to share their experiences and collaborate with adults turned out to be very beneficial. And in talking with colleagues after, I realized just how beneficial it was to hear all the different experiences and all the different feedback from different students, but especially when students were reiterating things. So it was really good. So um, in photos on the left, that was our future in learning. And on the right, that is from a student group at Hugo. So we are talking about and preparing for going to Dream of Wild Health in March once it gets a little bit warmer. I'm like, it just has to get a little warmer. But we're making herb pouches. So we've talked about the farm, everything that there is there. We've talked about different herbs and plants that are important to uh, indigenous communities. So we created that background and then we got into the crafts and making our own herb pouches, which is really fun. Further, there's some more herb pouches on the left and also the future of learning panel. December, elementary Indian Ed Clubs had storytelling as a theme for this month. We talked about Hiawatha and the Peacemaker, and then we identified um, peacemakers in our life and what that means and what it means to embody being a peacemaker. So it was cool to make that connection to real life, too, um, with this story in particular. Middle school clubs focused on community building as an icebreaker for our field trip. So we do college <coughs> campus visits. Um, that's a part of our Indian education program plan and our world's best workforce goals. Um, so I'm super happy to say that this year was the first time we ever filled a whole bus of students to go to the University of Minnesota Duluth. It was super, super fun. The ride home was a much easier than the ride there after the all you can eat ice cream. But, but it was, in the past, I will say we've had about 10 or 11 students. So, and I think the real change is that this year I kind of took a shift. So I kind of, in the past I focused predominantly on sixth through 12th grade. And I noticed that there was something just not quite working right in our high school setting. So I decided to shift and focus more on meeting individual student needs regarding college and career readiness, connecting them with resources, 
but still continuing the social justice platforms, and then shifted the Indian Ed Club focus to elementary through middle school, which I think, like, the, the bus was full of middle school students. So that was a really exciting just to see how that shift can really impact and cre create a sustainable effort in the future. Um, so yeah, we filled the bus to go to UMD where we met the American Indian Resource Center and also kind of talking about um, that shift that happened. It still didn't sit right with me that the Indian Ed Club shift had to go not away from middle schools, but there, we had to think of something creative. So I collaborated with Tim Whalen. Um, he has been coming to all of our APAC meetings. He's a rock star. And he told me, like, hey, if you don't have the capacity to do this every Friday or during Bears time every time, like, why don't you and I switch off? And it's the same curriculum. So we share the same curriculum as with every other student group and create conversation circles just about the indigenous experience at North. So that is a good way to show how other staff are stepping up and helping out and volunteering to fill in these gaps for all of our students at the end of the day, which is great. December and photos so on the left. Um, that's the planetarium at UMD, and it was actually super cool because we had um, an indigenous professor talk us through the planetarium, and he shared with us all of the Ojibwe and Dakota background of the planetarium, which was amazing. But I, I would say I would restructure the planetarium to become, come before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but this are all pictures from our field trip. It was a really, really great day. November, this is the last month I'll share. Um, Indian Ed Clubs has successfully launched in addition to our elementary schools. This was a big deal this year and I've really seen a lot of success come from it. Students are really excited and they know what's coming for them in years to come, which is really cool to kind of work that way instead of work backwards, which has been an intentional effort that I've seen the results in. Um, success story, full integration of native student population into programming with assistance of paraprofessionals. And what I mean by that is our special education students are fully incorporated into all of our Indian Ed programming. Um, so this is during our advisory time, it, apart from Central and Birch, we meet it, with elementaries, it's kind of harder to schedule in. Um, but it's been super helpful to have the paraprofessionals there and knowing that we have all of our students here and all the students who want to be here can be here. So that's been great. Um, 57 middle school students created ideas regarding activities or community organizations they would like to visit and participate in. Some of the activities, um, Catherine spoke to it a little bit earlier regarding the difference between a sixth grader and an eighth grader's <laughs> opinion. Um, but it was super cool the ideas that they did come up with that were low to no cost, that were community based. I was like, wow, like that's actually extremely simple and I, I never thought of that and that's perfect. We can do that like this week. So some of the ideas, I pulled them up. Um, Dream of Wild Health, which perfect, we got that down. A powwow, host a bonfire in the community. Tamarack Nature Center. We also have a teepee that our program has purchased in the past. So it's like, let's spend a day setting up the teepee and learning about it and then take it down together. So it's, they came up with a lot of really cool ideas, which I was excited to see. Um, and lastly, four middle school and high school students participated in the Nothing About Us Without Us Youth Summit through Equity Alliance Minnesota. <coughs> this feels like forever ago, almost at this point. But that day was the embodiment of student voice and student led. That's what my takeaways from it were, where it was entirely student ran, entirely student driven, and it was really great that our students were able to see what that looks like and then come back and talk about how can we recreate that here. So this is a picture of kind of that follow up conversation of how can we recreate that here. So South students met with Senator Weger <laughs> um, to discuss their experience at the Youth Summit and shared, shared ideas for legislative support. So it was kind of 
close, not closing the circle, but continuing on that circle to have those conversations and make sure it doesn't end with a really cool experience. But we keep having those conversations and keep creating those cool experiences where our students can be a part of them. So that is all I have to share today, but I would like to open it up for any questions you all may have. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you very much. I also want to just take note and, and recognize that the annual compliance overview and, and that is in the packet, it's an annual uh, uh, resolution that we put forth at a board meeting. I know you said Mr. Adams will be coming in to uh, present that to the board yep. and uh, that will be in the March way? Yep. Okay, so March just, and I'm, so I'm assuming it'll go back into the board packet and we'll continue moving through. Thank you very much for your work. Sounds Thank like you. a lot of good stuff. Thank Thanks. you. So we'll now move to our next uh, discussion on B3, which is the Achievement and Integration Plan. Dr. Gillespie. Hello. Thank you for having us come up. <laughs> so I asked um, Chris Strife OG, the principal at Willow Lane Elementary, our racially identifiable school, and Brian Morris, um, interim principal right now at Hugo, but our I'm going to give you a fuller title maybe than what you <laughs> had, our data you guru prior to that. Um, in case there were questions around graduation rate, Brian is, um, knows all the intricacies about that. And uh, so here to answer any questions. Chris and I um, worked closely on the plan together. As you'll see, um, Willow Lane being a racially identifiable school, identified by the Department of Education, also has its own specific part of the plan. So so every three years, we put together an achievement and integration plan. Um, we submit to the Minnesota Department of Education, and we are allocated funds. Um, and every year, we submit a budget. And so they give, um, we are up to submit our new plan. So this plan covers next school year through 2023. And really, the purpose of the funds that we, are, we get are to look at racial and economic integration, closing um, disparity gaps that exist within our system, making sure students have greater access to um, supports and programs and such like that, and really looking at how do we um, support our students in closing gaps based on racial and economic um, gaps, while also integration is a part of it, which sometimes gets missed in all of that. So how do we make sure that our students are experiencing um, activities that are meaningful and supportive with all different students from many different backgrounds? The MDE requires that we have three goals. One is around reducing disparities in academic achievement. The other is reducing disparities in equitable access to effective and more diverse teachers. This is a new strategy that was added this round for, um, or new goal, I should say, that was added this round as being required. And then finally looking at, again, increasing racial and economic integration. So our first goal for our whole plan, um, which impacts really our whole system is that our graduation rate for all of our high school students will, or all of our students will increase to 96 percent while disparity gaps between students of color american indian students students eligible for free and reduced lunch and white students are eliminated by 2022-23 and so really i took a lot of time working with um our cultural liaisons administrators leaders district leadership and built on a foundation that was very strong in terms of we've set a lot of things in motion and made progress on it, but how can we um, push the goals even further and then hold up our system and the people within our system accountable for um, progress in those areas. And so we've had a graduation rate goal. The target is increased from what we've had before and then adding the, the elimination of the, the disparity gaps that exist. The strategies, much like Jordan just talked about, are really aligned to how do we positively help students develop, come to school as them, their true selves and also develop an academic identity. And so things such as um, amplifying student voice, giving authentic opportunities for students to impact our system, authentically engaging with our family and community, and then obviously providing professional development for our staff are things that are based in a lot of research that show that these really have a positive impact for our students. Um, and change our system so that we better support our students. Um, so there's specific actions which you had a chance to look at the whole report, so I'm just gonna highlight uh, some of the bigger things that are new. 
We are implementing BAR at our high school starting next year. BAR stands for Building Assets, Reducing Risks. We were invited um, to participate in a Gates Foundation grant and we um, gladly accepted, which means that for five years we get support on imp implementing BAR. And BAR is, um, how do I say it? Education doesn't always have tons of lengthy empirical research that shows a positive impact on strategies. We don't have budgets like corporations to you know, spend a lot of money on research and evaluation. And BAR has made it through multiple levels of federal research done by the American Institute of Research on the positive impact that it's had for ninth graders. What that means is students are um, put into teams, cohorts, and so a group of three teachers has the same 180 students. And then they, so at, at North Campus next year, there will be four different teams. And now the student, it's not like middle school where they're in the same class and they go together, but they will all some point during their day have those same three teachers. Those three teachers meet regularly and talk about students and really have a, a protocol of how to make sure that they're being successful. And so BAR provides coaching for us. We will have um, a, a student success dean who will work directly with all the teachers that are involved with BAR, also providing interventions for students and supporting student success. And um, Stillwater High School is an anchor school and they have seen tremendous results in, in a few short years. They started with a failure rate of about 14%, I think, around that for their ninth graders and we're down less than 3% in less than three years. We have a similar failure rate right now, 13% of our ninth graders had one or more Fs. Um, and so we're excited about that. And so BAR aligns perfectly with increasing graduation, closing disparity gaps. Um, and so the Gates Foundation has given money to BAR so that schools can implement that program with fidelity. Um, additionally, students are taught what are called I-time lessons, which is talking about social and emotional strategies that they'll use, um, how to be strong students. And so, um, it's really exciting and we're excited to be a part of that. And so that is the biggest um, change. And then continuing to further and deepen around the other strategies that we had with working with Promise Fellows, our AVID programs are, are growing and are really strong and we're seeing positive results there. And then continuing with the support around engagement of our students and families supported through our cultural liaisons. I'm gonna stop after each strategy because I wanna make sure I get questions and I'm also conscious that we're slightly behind on the agenda. So I'm trying to do both at once. Are there any questions about strategy one or anything that you may have read? I do have a question. So, mm -hmm. and, and listen, if this is out of line, please just, I know you can't kick me, but you can kick me, I understand, right? <laughs> I so out of the students that are the 13% that have a fail, have you uh, determined which percentage of those are students of color and students that are not? Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's so approximately, and this is really approximate because this year I'm not at North, but Aunt Angela Nelson was looking into it for me. Approximately 30% of those Fs are students of color, which would mean that's an over-representation. Um, and then we looked at gender, we're looking at free and reduced lunch, so yeah, we, uh, we have. Um, we've changed our grading practices at North Campus, so we have seen a, a positive impact, it's just not as far as we want it yet. So this will be another way how we support students. And what BAR, they just came and introduced this to our 9-12 staff a couple weeks ago. They said what changes is now you have more eyes on all students and, and they're looking at the whole student experience. So your science teachers really know how their students are doing in science, but the, they don't know how they're doing in other subjects and this creates a structure so that you have more eyes on supporting students and reaching out and holding students accountable um, to, to you know, some of the supports we're trying to do. So. I'd be very curious on how far you guys dig into that, right? Because mm -hmm. I know as a father of a former student, right, and I'm not going to tell you what his grades are because he'd get really <laughs> upset with me, but, um, you know, I would, it's interesting to me, you know, t to where the, where the barriers are, right? Mm -hmm. What's creating that environment of them, you know, in their grades kind of going down as yep. far as, I mean, now I get a weekly assignment, you know, task that he's, you know, what assignments that maybe he's missing. Again, I'm not trying to get into that personal information, but I'd be very interested to hear that, yep, okay. that stuff. Absolutely. Other questions? I just have a question. Is, does this complicate scheduling? It does. Um, so what we've been doing is working with Stillwater, and that's part of our coach, is to help us. Um, so in the scheduling piece, teachers on those teams will have common prep periods. And so um, we've you know, looked at how does our structure, support structure work in terms
terms of what we've done before and how can we um, reset them a little bit. We're really treating this as the first thing we do, we're doing as a 912 high school campus. And so um, it does complicate it. We, um, we're confident we can figure it out and we're actually pretty far along in the process, but it has, but we've been working on it for months now already. Um, and one of the things that BAR really helps with is your coach is with you and they want you to have 80% of the, at least 80% of the students with those same three teachers, but knowing that students still need to have different classes and it won't be 100%. And so even with our split <coughs> campus, that makes it more challenging for us. Um, so they have been a great support saying if you can't get to the 80 the first year, you will, you'll figure it out. And so um, it's a five year commitment as part of the grant. But um, like I said, the, the data and how they're expanding it nationally, it shows tons of promise and, and I can't, I think we'll see a huge impact um, on success in ninth grade and ninth grade is a predictor for success in on-time graduation. Um, so even failing one class, you're, 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 it just drops in terms of the chances of you graduating on time. So. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right, thank you. So then goal number two is about, um, and this is really, we've, we've been doing this work, we've heard about this work, and again, extending us, is um, eliminating, eliminating the disparity between the percentages of students of color, American Indian students, no, sorry, I'm going, okay. American Indian students, students at free and reduced lunch, and white students who are enrolled and earning a grade of C or higher in rigorous coursework by 2022-23. We've done a lot of really great work and have closed a lot of the gaps that existed prior um, to our previous plan around students um, enrolled in our co uh, concurrent enrollment, which include AP classes, college and the schools classes, our career pathway classes that we have um, agreements with Century College and other um, different post-secondary institutions that we're working with. Um, <coughs> We still have some gaps that we're working on, but now we really are also um, continuing to deepen the focus on student success in those classes. And, and so um, making sure that students are passing those classes, and we've been tracking that data, but how can we use the resources in this um, plan to support that even further? And so we look at academic skill support for students, um, culturally responsive teaching professional development for the teachers teaching in those classes, and then again, continued support um, for all of our teachers and leadership around culturally responsive um, strategies. So um, we're working closely with Equity Alliance Minnesota for um, students who will have a chance to attend a summer immersion experience, and Equity Alliance will actually be leading that. Um, and students will attend with other students in, in, in the member districts and then also have teachers um, of color who look like them and, and are <coughs> EP teachers. And so that experience um, is super exciting. So how do we provide students um, a preview of what they're going to learn in their upcoming classes? They can earn a, a credit or an elective credit for that work in the summer if they choose to do a project, but it's another um, opportunity to give students um, a positive experience and, and build their confidence before they enter their class. Um, we also are looking at proactive student supports throughout the year. So how can we help students have before and after school study groups, study groups during their time and then provide coaching for teachers to use those strategies um, in the class. And then again, really looking at, we've done a lot of professional development to support our teachers. And so um, how can we provide even more coaching in partnership with Equity Alliance so that when teachers try different strategies in their classes, they can process how it went sooner. That is a gap in our system. It's hard for us to always put those, in, those um, supports in place. And so teachers having time to process, I tried this, I don't know if it went well, it, with someone other than their administrator, which can sometimes be hard to really truly have those coaching conversations. Any questions on strategy number two? No, I think we're good. All right, so our third strategy and um, our third goal is 100% of White Bear Lake Area Schools educators will receive professional development and culturally responsive teaching pedagogy so that students have greater access to culturally responsive staff by 22-23. The strategies, um, one talks about recruiting and retaining staff of color. I could have had that as our goal. Um, that is a goal for our system. We talk about it frequently. We have strategies in place. Um, I talked a lot with people and we put the goal number three around the professional development of our current educators to help us make sure that we move towards that in a, in a faster way. We have a, a wonderful system that's been working on many of those things, but really wanting to commit that 100% of our educators will receive that. And it supports the work that we've been engaged in with the district equity and achievement team. Um, and so, Looking at some intentional actions around that, 
is how um, Equity Alliance, again, has an educator of color network and how can we partner with them. Um, I reached out to our teachers union, I'm gonna say, it has a new name, I don't remember the number, <laughs> um, Wiper Lake areas, Tiffany help me. Educators, local 17 Thank you, I'm, try I'm trying really hard to do it right. <laughs> Um, so I reached out to our uh, president, Tiffany, Matt Mons, our executive director of HR, and really how can we partner together to provide true support for um, our staff of color so that we retain people and they are excited about being here while he has allowed us to do creative things around recruiting high staff, um, highly qualified staff of color. And so um, we're still in the works, but this um, plan would support that and we're excited about the potential that's there. Um, also, how can we have our staff of color help co-create professional development? So when they're experiencing professional development around culturally responsive, it's different than having training that we would give to all our white educators as well. So it's not that that professional development isn't needed, but how is it created in a lens through that meets the needs of our educators of color? And then again, professional development for our leaders and educators. Any other? questions on goal three is I talk faster than I've ever talked and I'm pretty fast so I'm doing, <laughs> doing all right okay all right so then um, really I worked very closely with Chris on the Willow Lane portion and so to be identified as a racially identifiable school your demographics have to be greater than 20% of your district's average demographics and so um, Willow Lane is I've had the pleasure of getting to know that school this year. It's been super fun. I have a reading buddy there. And so um, I'm going to let Chris kind of go through and highlight some of the work. But we worked closely together, and it's aligned to the other goals that we have as well. <coughs> Welcome, Chris. OK, so this one, we, it was looking at our elementary students would be at or above grade level in reading as me measured by multiple assessments. Um, and disparities in achievement will be eliminated between students of color, American Indian students, Students on frame reduce lunch and white students. Our strategies are to increase classroom engagement by reducing disciplinary action um, and then trauma-informed student supports. And our goal was around, um, uh, our goal was last year to decrease, was it was the, what was the previous one? The, it was, no, I don't remember the exact, so it was, I remember no, it was it, I, by reducing disciplinary action at school, our referrals went down by, I, have this, I, have, I do too actually. Our referrals went down by, okay, you look for it. Seven, uh, 40, suspensions are decreased by 40%, um, and then referrals went by, down by 17%. And I think we looked at it over three years and our referrals were down by 40 two percent over three years so we're pretty excited about that and where we are this year right now compared to last year mid-year at the end of the second quarter we were down 56 percent so we're pretty excited to see some really good movement in that area what's considered a referral an office discipline referral so a major referral like a write-up I don't know what they call them at different like any schools. teacher can do an office referral any right? teacher can write a referral so it's really working with staff on what that what is appropriate to write one for. And to give you an idea, numbers over three years ago we were for the whole year over seventeen hundred, and this year mid year we were at two hundred and forty five. So it's huge, massive. And it's going to be we're just super excited about um, what that's going to look like in our academic achievement. Okay, so. So the actions, really, this is where you'll see a majority of the funds allocated. Chris has a student success coordinator um, who supports that work and really takes some proactive approaches, so it does supports with academics as well, but how do we use restorative justice? And I mean, it's been huge, obviously, yes. shown in the yes. data. So the, the, he's done a lot with restorative dialogue. We've done a lot with PBIS. A lot of different prongs in there that are really helping um, with the dialogue and the, the system um, and our teachers and our thinking. And we've done some things like don't write a referral for the first six weeks. It's not that we won't deal with those issues. We just won't be doing it that way. <coughs> so we still met with parents, talked to parents, did things the same way that we would have, but we didn't really apply consequences because we felt like it was relationship building for the 
students and the staff as well and time to get to know you uh, we do have a, a uh, some student mobility uh, that's a little high for what I think is high. It's, I don't know, 15, I think we looked at that 15%, 16%, but so we want to get to know our students before we start doing that. And then our Miss Kendra program is what you probably have heard of, the Alive program that started at Willow three years ago with the counselor model, with the grant, <coughs> and uh, through the Sour Family Foundation. And now we'll be switching over to a more teacher-driven next year and they'll be doing some training with that um, in April and then uh, taking over the, the teachers will be teaching these lessons the second goal I'll take this one um, is okay. is the same as I, what I just talked about in terms of our goal for 100% of our teachers and so the um, strategies are the same what's different is I've allocated money in there for specific um, sessions for professional development once it's created and developed solely for um, Willow Lee and staff that Chris will be able to um, work with Equity Alliance around in terms of supporting them. Um, and then again with uh, uh, how we're supporting and retaining racially and <coughs> ethnically diverse teachers, Willow Lane has their own specific goals on how we increase um, staff members who are representative of their student demographics. And then the third one was really fun to talk about um, and open up is Willow Lane, because it's a racially identifiable school, it has to have um, integrated an integration experience for students. And so our students have participated with um, Otter Lake and visited Tamarack um, Nature Center for some time. And it's been a positive experience. And um, Chris and then the principal at Otter Lake, um, Cynthia Mueller, are really looking at ways to enhance that experience and make it even more impactful for students. And so we talk, we have some details around that in the plan. And then adding an additional experience for Willow Lane students with students at Onika. And so Equity Alliance Minnesota provides professional development for students around being culturally responsive leaders in fifth grade. And so each school's um, students will go through that professional development and then they'll have activities together. And really how can that positively impact our school system when kids um, at Willow Lane and kids who go to Hugo or Onika have experienced very different um, schooling experiences, especially around racial um, diversity. And so how can we help students Students get to know each other and build relationships and skills early on um, much like Jordan was talking about to positively um, impact our system from the younger ages and we often think of the high school age kids and, and kind of bookending both experiences so that we can make sure our kids they have a lot of power in setting the climate and culture amongst themselves for sure in schools and so how can we positively do that so the Onika staff is really excited about it. I think Willow Lane's super excited about it. And so um, really I, I opened it up to all our elementary principals and so there's a lot of opportunity in there for schools to have professional development to, to impact our student experience for the positive. And we met with the Equity Alliance today about that specific culturally responsive school leadership. And they work with all kids around like even <coughs> identity and culture and helping them, even schools like Onika where they don't have a lot of diversity, they have those conversations and teach kids how to talk about them. And then we talked about wrapping culturally relevant language around, this is super exciting, I have been able to tell you, the <laughs> second steps curriculum that all elementary schools are using. So how do you, when you're thinking about empathy, what does that mean when you're looking at um, empathizing with people of different colors, different uh, races, different cultures, ethnicities, how do we, how does that play into it and how can we weave that into all of the social emotional learning at, throughout the, the district because I think, I think it goes both ways. Um, at, actually personally I think at Willow a lot, our kids know how to engage with lots of different cultures. It's when um, we have kids that don't that it's, it's, it's hard on, on, on a, they don't know how to interact. They don't know how to engage. So then each one of the strategies you'll see has progress measurements. Um, they, they are either academic measures that we have, student attendance and behavior, family surveys, um, professional development attendance that's required in the plan and I really tried to push us as a system in terms of the results of, of data that we already collect and then include different ways to authentically collect student voice and staff voice. And I've had a lot of support in creating this plan, and so I just wanted to acknowledge all the different committees that have worked and supported. Um, it's been really fun. I got a little bit obsessed with it. It reminded me of my dissertation, like, yes, we have to do this. So um, it's exciting, and it has a really an opportunity to impact our system for the positive, so.
I didn't do too bad with the time. All right. Well done. Any uh, questions before we end? Questions, comments? I have. One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does the uh, family engagement portion of this involve? So, usually these students who maybe struggle, there could be environmental issues outside of the school that. Mm -hmm. So really, our cultural liaisons do a lot of that work right now. Equity Alliance is putting together a, a, a structure for what that could look like in terms of how we um, support authentic family engagement. And so part of that would be our cultural liaisons getting trained in a method of how do we um, have parents feel like their voices are authentically heard in school, have impacts, really use their experience to help us guide what we're trying to do for students. There's a lot of research on um, Often we think of family engagement as one way. We as a school need something and we're gonna give it to you and we need you to come here and instead of how can we be partners in education with you. Um, and we've been doing work, it's in our strategic plan as well, around uh, an equitable family engagement um, framework. And so that work would be complemented with that, which we, we just are finalizing some of that work. So we could definitely come and share more. I, um, also, our new director of equity position that we just um, posted would have a lot of opportunity to influence moving that forward because this really this year has been more foundational in terms of just setting up some of the systems for it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? I just want to make a general comment about all the things that we've heard about tonight. I think it's really easy to kind of get stuck in your world and the, the experiences that you have individually, but this is some really remarkable work that is going on around the district and it's really fantastic to hear about all the different ways that this equity work is webbing out. So I'm, I'm so excited about the trajectory of the district in, in this case and thank you for all of your work and I should have said this when Catherine and uh, <laughs> Jordan and everybody were here still but it's really incredible stuff. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say at the board meeting next time I saw that the budget that I gave you was not actually what I needed you to see so I will ask for a resolution to look at the budget and the plan and so I'll make sure you get the overview page in your next board packet okay thank you with that we move to our final discussion uh, oh I'm sorry Dr. Newmaster do you have a comment I did and I also appreciated all the exciting things that are happening and for somebody that's been around a long time waiting, it's good to see things happening and discussions and readings. And we've started things before, but I don't think they've ever quite gotten to first base. I mean, we've tried many things. So I really appreciated everything that was presented. And I believe in our mission, and I believe in our academic achievement strategies and the only thing I would ask is that we remember that your elementary media centers hopefully will be strengthened again um, we want to increase student achievement and create equitable educational opportunities all of us do we want to reduce academic disparities and we look at that in all of these ways and the one thing that I have said before, and I'll say it again, is there's multiple national studies that provide data demonstrating that a robust elementary media center is a significant variable in creating, playing a critical role in reducing the achievement gap between kids, especially kids that are marginalized, but also improving the achievement of all of our kids. So I do hope that we're going to look at that because that's another factor. We've got lots of good factors in play, but this year we've had a big gap. And I know that our facilities committee from the presented to us that all the media centers were going to be approved. The board approved the financing for that big project. So now we're going to have wonderful media centers coming down the pike and we need to put our media <coughs> program back <coughs> so that they can provide that literacy, trans literacy, programming, individual support for all of our kids that have these things that are just driving them as they have their own agency. They need somebody to help. So I hope we look at that again. And that's part of the program because the data is there. 
we've got good stuff going. Let's keep it up and add. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, with that, uh, I know we're running a little long, but uh, we'll move into our last uh, discussion item before. Uh, which is the project labor agreement consideration. Um, <clears throat> before I turn it over to Dr. Kazmichek, I want to uh, just say and make kind of a statement and just let everybody know as we as we discuss this consideration, we discuss this project, um, I want to just say that, uh, and most of you already know this about me, um, that I am a, a member of the building trades, a proud <coughs> member of the building trades. I've been in the union construction industry for 25 years plus. Um, but I wanted to make sure that everybody know, knew that. Uh, and also I want to make sure that everybody knows that at no time uh, is if in this consideration or uh, depending on, you know, no matter how this thing turned out, would there be any financial gain for the organization in which I belong to? So uh, I will tell you that uh, I would plan on abstaining from the vote just because I think it would be proper to do so. But uh, I wanted to make sure that I said that before we move forward with uh, any topics. That, uh, Dr. Kazmichak. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. I'd like to welcome Mick Waldsberger here tonight, uh, School Board's Legal Counsel. He's going to facilitate a conversation around this topic. So thanks for coming, Mick. Absolutely. Sorry we're a little late, but uh, no, no problem. Great well, meetings. So. Thank you for having me, everybody. Uh, sorry, I have a sore throat tonight, so if I'm reaching for my water, that is why. Um, I'm going to talk today about the potential benefits and the potential costs of a project labor agreement. And what I'm going to really do for you is outline the arguments that have been made historically. And it's going to ultimately be up for you to weigh those types of considerations and make your own determinations. Um, but I will give you my view on it if you ask me. Uh, but again, I ultimately think it's your responsibility to weigh the various considerations. Um, I will provide you a summary in writing under the attorney-client privilege after this meeting, um, not directly after, but in the days following so that you have that with some additional detail. And the reason for that is in the event that you were sued, let's say you decide to go forward with one or you decide not to go forward with one, I might include additional information in that attorney-client privileged document that I wouldn't necessarily want publicly available uh, in a school board meeting. So you'll have that. I would encourage you to ask me questions uh, throughout the process, but I'm also going to encourage you not to advocate for a position until I'm done. And then certainly if you want to have full discussion, you can. And the reason for that is, as the board chair mentioned, um, there are potential issues of conflict of interest, uh, and I want to talk about those. I want to talk about the process. And that is really meant to protect you. Uh, it's not meant to be accusatory to suggest that anybody has anything wrong or anything to hide. And again, the information was just put out up front. But there is something called a statutory conflict of interest. There is a common law conflict of interest. And of course, then there's something called an appearance of impropriety, which uh, is something we can also talk about. But I just want to do that to protect you because I do represent the board. I don't represent any individual employees. I don't represent superintendent. I represent the board. And as part of that, my job is to help you make informed decisions that protect you as well. So with that, uh, some of you probably have a good sense of what a project labor agreement is and some might not. A uh, project labor agreement is, uh, the short version, is an agreement between a public employer like a school district and an exclusive representative, so a union, usually a trades council, an overarching kind of entity. And as part of that agreement, the school district uh, agrees to designate, again, the exclusive rep as the exclusive representative of all individuals who are going to work on that construction project. And as part of that, all contractors and subcontractors who work on the contract must agree to abide by the terms and conditions of the collective bargaining agreements that the exclusive representative has in effect for the various trade groups. So your pipe fitters, your plumbers, your carpenters, your painters, you know, you name it. Each of the various trade groups, there's a collective bargaining agreement. And anyone who works in any of those areas has to be paid according to that. And so the employers have to, to pay them pursuant to those collective bargaining agreements. Additionally, under some project labor agreements, there can be requirements that uh, all hiring has to happen through union hiring halls or referrals through hiring halls. All selection of employees can have to occur through union hiring halls. So it just depends that there are some variations that occur with uh, different ones, but the, in the nutshell, what I described is what a project labor agreement is. The primary benefit 
of a project labor agreement is you have a guarantee that there's never going to be a strike because the, the trades council, the overarching exclusive representative, can guarantee even if those collective bargaining agreements expire, you're not going to ever have any kind of strike, work stoppage, um, boycott, picketing, you name it. They keep everybody in line. And um, so if you have a situation where you have a volatile labor market, that can be a significant benefit. You know, if you have strikes on the horizon or things are happening around you, um, and that would be a concern, that might be a reason that would take you toward a project labor agreement because you get to avoid all that. And when you get to avoid strikes, that takes you to the other major benefit is that project labor agreements generally have a uh, high level of uh, assurance that projects will be completed on time because you don't have work stoppages. So because you don't have the strike, you don't have the work stoppage. Now, you'll see as I go through with each of these, I'm always going to give you the counter argument, um, and including to the, the cost of project labor agreements. The counter argument that non-unionized businesses will uh, tell you is that you're saying that a, you want a project labor agreement to avoid strikes. But what you're really saying is, so you're using unionized labor, which presents a risk of a strike. If you never used unionized labor, you wouldn't have a risk in the first place. So. You're being asked to use unionized labor and then enter into this more onerous project labor agreement to avoid a strike. And non-unionized businesses say that doesn't make sense. That's a nonsensical kind of a situation. Um, the other thing that they'll say in terms of delay, uh, non-unionized businesses, is that delays can largely be avoided through penalty clauses in contracts, standard construction contracts. And that's uh, generally how it is done, I would tell you, is that if someone is over in their days of, you know, the date when it, something is due, they have to pay so much in liquidated damages, and that goes up and up and up. And so that's another way to keep the project on time, and that's what non-unionized groups will tell you is their, their way of, of doing that. The other main argument that you see in favor of a project labor agreement is that, um, and, and we've received letters. I don't know if the board's been receiving them. Uh, I know that the district as a whole has been letters and emails. But folks will argue that it helps create careers. It secures higher wages. It secures better health insurance benefits. It secures retirement benefits that wouldn't otherwise be available. And in turn, that benefits families in your community. And it also benefits the students who are attending then, the schools in your community. <coughs> and so the the notion here is that by doing this project labor agreement, you're really helping out uh, societally, if you will. And non-unionized businesses then counter that argument by saying, well, that just confirms that you're paying a premium. You're paying a higher price for your construction project because that, how else could you pay everybody higher wages, higher retirement benefits, higher health insurance benefits, etc." So now let's talk about the potential costs. Non-unionized businesses will say that um, requiring a project labor agreement has a significant potential to divide the community that just came together and approved your referendum. Um, and they argue that that will occur because roughly 70% of the workforce is non-unionized. And um, it makes little sense, they'll argue, to exclude that 70% of the workforce in your community. Project labor agreement proponents or PLA proponents will say, well, wait a minute, nobody's really excluded. Anybody can bid on the project. Uh, you just have to agree to the terms and conditions of the collective bargaining agreement that's in place for the unionized employees uh, under the exclusive representative. And I, I want to talk about that for a minute because um, this might be one place where, you know, the argument's kind of butt up, but there is some reality here. And the reality is that what if a non-unionized business provides higher pay and higher benefits than happen to be provided in a collective bargaining agreement? You're actually required to provide the lower benefits if you, in order to bid on the project labor agreement. You have to change and provide the lower benefits. What if you have a very small business, let's say for example a small business of painters, maybe five painters, and they're all equal owners in the company. And they live in the White Bear Lake community and they can't pay wages, insurance benefits, retirement benefits as high as what's required in the collective bargaining agreement through the exclusive representative. They would love to bid on it. They bid lower. They're a small business. They're, they run lean. And they would all benefit. And they're all in your community. But they can't do it 
Not that they're shorting their workers, because they are their workers. They are their owners, but they can't afford it. And when I think of that, I think of the concept that no one would expect my law firm of 16 attorneys to pay the same as a law firm like Dorsey Whitney that has hundreds and hundreds of attorneys across the country and across the world. Uh, so there are different level of benefits. Another tough question is, what if the non-unionized business pays lower wages but makes a higher health insurance premium contribution? Or a lower health insurance premium contribution, for that matter. As you probably know, most insurers will not allow a business to change its health insurance premium contributions mid-year. So the practical reality is there is truth to the notion that if you are paying different benefits than what the collective bargaining agreement requires through project labor agreement, it can be very tough for you to bid and work on that agreement um, and make those same kind of benefits available to your employees. Um, and you have to ask too, is it realistic to expect that your community businesses are going to do that or be able to do that? And I would just ask you, how realistic would it be for you to say, we're gonna take our teachers union here and wipe out their collective bargaining agreement and pay them the exact same wages and benefits that are paid by a neighboring district. Well, depending which direction you go, it might be great. You might say that's lesser pay for, I mean, we might save a lot of money. Teachers might be very unhappy. But maybe if you go toward Moundsview, and I don't know if Moundsview pays higher than you or not, but maybe they do, and then what then? So think of how hard that shift is. And that's really what businesses have to do in order to bid on the project labor agreement. So that's the, the primary criticism that you hear. And there's some validity to some of those points. Just like there's validity to the point that you're not gonna have work stoppages with a project labor agreement. Community members, um, when you read articles and you pull periodicals on this, community members may conclude that requiring a project labor agreement is a personally and politically motivated decision instead of a business decision that they expect you to make. In regard to personal motivation, you just have to review the emails that you get in support of a project labor agreement. What do they almost always say? I'm a member of the union. My life has been changed. My life has been bettered by being a member of the union. And I applaud that. That's great. But what are they saying? Do this because it's going to benefit me as part of the union going forward. So there's your personal motivation piece. Non-unionized businesses will tell you that requiring the project labor, labor agreement can erode public trust and cause the public to conclude that you're using those public funds to further some interest other than finding the lowest responsible bidder, other than being the steward of tax dollars that you should. In regard to political motivation, um, sometimes this is something that had not occurred to me initially, but when I did a lot of research on it, I found that um, typically your trades councils make significant donations politically. They don't make them equally to both parties. You know, in, in 2018, there was a lawsuit against the Minneapolis School District, which was ultimately dismissed voluntarily uh, by the group that brought it. But as part of that, one of the pieces of data that came out is that the Minneapolis Building Trades Council contributed exclusively to candidates in the Minnesota DFL. And so there is your argument for political motivation as opposed to a, a balanced approach. Um, Non-unionized businesses argue that there are fewer bidders when you use a PLA and fewer bidders means less competition and less competition means higher costs. And the premise of that argument, I would tell you that fewer businesses will submit bids, I believe is undeniably true. But what we don't know is whether fewer bidders actually translates into higher costs. There's no way to know that. So, I mean, all, part of that argument, you know, obviously is true. Part of it, we just don't know if that's true or not. But um, non-unionized businesses will persuasively counter and come back and say, the more bidders you have, that certainly doesn't present a risk of higher cost. <laughs> you know, there's no risk of having more bidders. There's only a risk of having fewer bidders. Um, and they also point to a 2017 study, and I can't tell you the validity of the study, but it is out there uh, from 2017 saying that project labor agreements increase the cost of projects by roughly 20 <coughs> per square foot. Again, I, I don't have access to that. I can't scrutinize that, but that is something that um, organizations point to. Minnesota courts have held that under the um, bid law, you may require a project labor agreement as part of the bid law. So that, that's not a legal concern. 
But what we do have is other lawsuits around the country that pop up asserting that there are other grounds for challenging these agreements. And one of the more significant grounds that continues to pop up lately is based on the Janus decision. And as some of you may know, in 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court said that it is unconstitutional to require an employee to pay a public employee to pay union dues because some of those dues go to advancing the union's political interests, which may be contrary to the employee's constitutional views or their individual views and constitutional rights. And so if an employee can't be compelled to pay union dues, non-unionized businesses argue that an employee can't be compelled to work for a union, can't be compelled to accept the terms of a union contract. Um, similarly, they argue requiring an employer to pay wage rates similar, um, or wage rates of the union raises similar concerns. Now, I'm not going to tell you I think those lawsuits are going to succeed or not. Frankly, it's uncertain. But what we do know is there is an increased lit litigation, I believe, in my view of my heart, when you have a project labor agreement. Whether you win at the end of the day um, is a different question, and I, I believe that based on current law right now, you probably win at the end of the day. Um, if you decide to go with a project labor agreement. But it's going to be a fight. And we already know from other organizations, you know, ABC is your big um, anti-project labor agreement uh, organization. Um, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it, we know that they've already corresponding with the district. They're watching it carefully. You've got the largest um, bond ever in the history of the state of Minnesota for a school district. You better believe folks are going to be looking at this as the test case. And there's no question about that in my mind. So, and when you have litigation revolving around contracts or construction types of things, almost never are they covered by insurance, which means you're going to be funding that lawsuit out of your pocket. Uh, again, regardless of how it turns out at the end of the day, um, that's a, a cost that you have to be aware of uh, going forward. I do want to talk about potential conflicts of interests. Um, just so that you're aware of what's out there and the process to go forward to protect yourself. Um, Don, you mentioned that uh, you have a position with St. Paul um, Construction Buildings and Trades Council, and uh, I would want to make sure that you have gone through that process so that nobody can come back later and accuse you of having not done it properly. And anybody else that might have an interest um, one way or another that could raise some, some question. You always want to be upfront and transparent about these things. So first of all, there's uh, two types of conflicts of interest. There's a statutory conflict of interest, which is the most significant of them. It's a gross, gross misdemeanor. You can go to jail for a year and a $3,000 fine if you violate that statute. And what the statute says is that a public officer who is authorized to take part in any manner in the making of any sale, lease, or contract. So you sit on the board, you're authorized to enter into a contract. A project labor agreement is a contract. Um, an official capacity shall not voluntarily have a personal financial interest in that contract or personally benefit therefrom. And of course, public officers are school board members. So um, as I mentioned, there's a significant penalty from that. In addition, you can be removed from the board and the contract is void if any board member has a statutory conflict of interest. The courts have repeatedly held that you have that conflict of interest, even if it's an indirect interest. All that matters is you have some personal financial gain, small as it may be, any personal financial gain. So some examples that we know from the courts and from the Minnesota Attorney General's office are, if you hold stock or shares in the, the entity that's entering into the project labor agreement with you. So let's say it's a trades council. If you happen to hold stock or shares in that if it happens to issue stock or shares. If you're an officer or manager of that company or that entity, you automatically <coughs> have a conflict of interest. Um, if you receive a salary commission or other compensation that's in fact affected in any part or any way by the granting of that contract, you have a conflict of interest. You do not have a conflict of interest just by virtue of being an employee. So the, the courts and the AG really distinguish between kind of an officer manager position and an ordinary employee. If you're just a regular employee, there's no conflict of interest there. When it's a statutory conflict of interest, you can't cure the conflict by abstaining from the vote. You have a conflict whether you vote or not, and that's what makes it so difficult to have that. Um, and in addition, the Minnesota <coughs> Attorney General in a couple of opinions has said, 
that it extends beyond just voting. It extends to participating in discussions about it. And that's why I wanted you to hold off until I'm all done. Um, it, again, it can, if you're just trying to convince others, directly or indirectly, to enter into a contract that would otherwise have a conflict, you have a conflict. So uh, and you're violating the law. So you have to be careful. With that. So what do you do? How do you vet this out? How do you make sure you're clean? Well, the Minnesota Attorney General has laid out a process, and the courts have two, that said that the school board decides in the first instance whether a conflict of interest exists. And what you do is you have to gather all the relevant facts, and then you have to adopt a resolution with findings and conclusions about whether a conflict exists. And courts give that a significant amount of weight. And they could overturn it if it's ridiculous, obviously. You know, you own a, a company that sells vans and you enter into a contract <coughs> to sell vans to the school district and you're on the school board and you say, you pass a resolution saying no conflict, obviously the courts are gonna turn that over. But if it's a reasonable situation, they're gonna give it a lot of weight. So it's a process you wanna follow. How do you gather that information? There are a number of ways you could do it. You can use a questionnaire. We can develop a questionnaire, provide information that way. Um, we can have affidavits. We could do an interview, have somebody do interviews of board members. And ultimately, if you're not sure, you can ask the attorney general for an opinion, although this attorney general and the previous one have issued very few opinions. And in the past, they used to issue a lot of time, but it hasn't been very common here. So let's move on to a common law conflict of interest. A common law conflict of interest is broader than a statutory conflict of interest. You can have a common law conflict of interest when you don't have a direct financial benefit or gain from, from a contract. And um, what the law says is that you have a common law conflict of interest if you have any direct interest in the outcome. Again, it doesn't have to be financial. And so the classic example I can give to you is, let's say that um, you're on the school board and your spouse is a teacher in the school district. And let's say you have completely separate financial accounts. Well, you share a house and you both contribute to your expenses in your home in some way. And your spouse is brought up for termination in front of the school board. That's a common law conflict of interest. You have a direct interest in the outcome. That's certainly your marital happiness does. So um, you can't vote on that. And unlike a statutory conflict of interest, when it's a common law conflict of interest, you can cure it or avoid it by abstaining from the vote. And so that's a critical distinction between the two. Although the penalties are really essentially the same if you go forward with that. Um, so same process, you follow the exact same process for vetting that out and determining whether there's a conflict of interest. In terms of an appearance of impropriety, I don't want to go through that too much. That's just a matter of undermining public trust and confidence in what you're doing. You know, if the questions come up from the public, do you have some self-dealing interest, some benefit, some motivation? And the way to really address that is being as transparent as you can, talking about things as openly as you can, so that um, everyone knows where you stand as a board. And if there's a potential need to evaluate whether a conflict of interest exists, and I would encourage you to do so here, not because I'm concluding that one does. I don't have nearly enough information to, to draw any kind of conclusions. But there's enough that would raise questions external to this body <coughs> that I think you have to build in time to, that, to go through that process before you make a decision on whether you're gonna go forward. Just one other consideration you have for project labor agreement. Um, and it doesn't have to take long. You know, I'm not suggesting this is a month by month by month. This, you can fill out questionnaires, you can answer questions, you can have it done in a week, and then come back and pass a resolution at your next board meeting. But I do think you have to make that decision before you vote on whether or not you have, you're gonna go forward with a project labor agreement. Because let's say you go forward, vote yes, and one of your folks has a conflict of interest. Now you got a problem. So that's too late to address it then. So that's the, the kind of the nutshell version of it, if you will. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I do think this is one of the areas where uh, I remember what my, I clerked for a Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin, and I remember what he would tell me all the time, which is let common sense be your guidepost. I think that's about the best advice I can give you when it comes to weighing out the considerations here. Don't jettison your common sense, because you, you should have some sense of where to go uh, with this, but um, one way or another, then make it and move forward. So with that, I'll take any questions you have, and then, um, again, it may be wise to delay in advocating for a position until you've gone through that process, in my opinion, but you, 
I don't have control of that. Your board chair has control of that as the presiding officer at this table. So <clears throat> before we go there, I just want to, um, as far as a survey goes, I, obviously I, I totally respect that I have a conflict of interest, right? I'm, I've said that in the beginning, I'm saying that now I, I know that even without filling out a survey, but I think that probably the survey would be the best course of action uh, to kind of move this thing through to make sure that we're all, we're, we're being as transparent as possible. Um, I do have a couple questions, you bet. and I'm going to be very vague on my questions, is that you had talked about politically earlier about the Minneapolis building trades. Uh, do you know how many Republicans are inside of the Minneapolis building trades for them to make contributions to? I don't. In your research? I don't, but I know it's the union as a bot, as an entity, not the members that made the And I'll typically tell you that, and it's been my experience over the 25 years, mm -hmm. and being a political director of a union, right? Mm -hmm that we give contributions equally across the board to both parties. But that being said, and then I also had a question probably for Dr. Kazmierczak. At one time you had said that this project would be also considered that we would uh, enact prevailing wage on the project. Is that still the case? That's what we currently do. That's what we currently do across the board. We would act at prevailing wage. So would that be, would that be your intent to consistently do that I think for that these projects? That should be part of this conversation as well. Okay. <coughs> so are you familiar what prevailing wage is? Generally speaking, yep. So you're going to pay, why don't you go ahead? You're well, going to pay. I know exactly what it is, but I'd like for you to explain it to the group as if, so, so that everybody knows what it is. Yeah, my understanding is so you're going to have an established wage, whatever the prevailing wage of the community is through the union contracts. It's done by county. Yep, and it's going to be provided. So anybody who works on the project has to pay that wage rate. So in the wages is determined by the Department of Labor and Industry every year. They they collect all this all the information every June, right? They then publish that information in July. So every year there is a prevailing wage that's set. And it's county by county. Yeah, Correct. but it's by county. All eighty seven counties have a, mm -hmm. a prevailing wage. Ramsey County being the one of the most dominant that get uh, reports in and Hennepin County typically set a wage and, and they have a they have the Department of Labor and Industry has a system in place that manages that so it's not set by any said person it's set by county from the from the state so i just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of that yep. and so i do that, think that that's separate from a project labor agreement but certainly is a consideration for the board to have in deciding whether to go forward with you know and how you want to go forward with the project that's totally within your purview totally legal to do that it's certainly within your purview one way or another okay Spoloy, did you have a question? Yeah, I think you just answered that's completely separate from a PLA to we would have to what adopt policy to do that for this project or how would that work? No, I mean it, it probably would make the most sense to do that or you know take some guidance perhaps on that but it is a resolution that's done and it's part of your bid process then so that when folks bid on the contract they know that they're gonna have to pay prevailing wage because that in impacts their their estimate of their costs as they go forward. So, Dr. Master, so for, for that, would there be a conflict of interest for me because the state sets that wage, I, that the, the Trades Council does not set the wage? I don't, again, I don't believe that there would be. I don't know of any way that it could be or would be. I would certainly talk with you about it. If you had a concern, I would want to make sure you're protected and that, you know, again, we're transparent and we follow the process if you have a concern. But sitting here right now, just because of your position on the Trades Council, I don't know how that would impact prevailing wage determination. I, I don't see a conflict from that as I sit here right now, but I'm happy to talk about that with you privately and gather the information if you'd like. Okay, Dr. Newmaster. I guess my question is for Wayne and Tim or whoever said, we've had some big projects on roofs and um, oh, what was the stadium, some of the stadium work. And I guess we never talked about PLAs or wages or benefits we just in my mind it just got bit so how did we do big things in the past we followed bid law we didn't have a we didn't have a pla in place we just followed the existing statute and went through a bidding process so did so we the lowest do. responsible bidder was awarded the contract and it seems to me like we picked the lowest bid yep and then uh Prevailing wage provisions have been included. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what I wondered. So was that included? So they didn't 
put it below yep. sustainable wages. Yep. Does that say anything about benefits? Prevailing wage. Prevailing wage does, and I go to Mick, and but I mean understanding that prevailing wage does determine benefits and everything else. Yeah, on a more limited scope than a project labor agreement does. You wouldn't what, have a, what a prevailing wage does not include is industry funds. For example, we, if, a, if a contract, if a collective bargain agreement has a industry fund that management and the, the members uh, all contribute into, it doesn't include that fund, but it does include benefits. But not like retirement benefits, for example. It would include health insurance. I believe it's health insurance and... And I'll verify that for you, but you should. Yeah, but I do not believe that there's a retirement benefit requirement. I don't believe. I believe that in prevailing wage, they include the retirement benefit, but the retirement benefit doesn't get paid to the organization in which holds it. So, for example, if if Mick is working as a painter and the retirement benefit is ten dollars an hour, let's just say, then that would get put onto his check. And he would then still get it and be able to invest it how he wishes, but it's still required that he pays the benefit, is my understanding of, of what it is. And I'll certainly clarify that in that follow up communication for the board. Ms. Olson. I have several questions. Um, so, my first question is you said that 70% of labor in Minnesota is non union. That that, that's the argument that is made repeatedly by, actually the, the argument is it's slightly higher than 70% is non-unionized, that's made by the non-unionized workforce, yeah. Okay, because I, I did some research today, I was trying to find some objective information on the internet, and it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics say that Minnesota is one of the higher union percentages in, in the country. Um, but so my question is, 70% non-union, my fear, and I guess you know maybe this is just a comment, is when you were talking about eroding public trust, um, the the idea that if we decide to to limit our bids to a smaller percentage of the population, when we have just asked for three hundred and twenty six million dollars, I mean, is that going to be something that people in this community really come after us for. I would expect you would face criticism for that, yes. But when you, when you say, so face criticism, because that's the next, my next question, is then what is the likelihood of us getting sued? I think if you enter into a project labor agreement, you're unlikely to get a lawsuit from an average Joe citizen. You're likely to get a lawsuit from one of the large organizations like ABC. Um, and I can't remember the acronym, I can look it up, I have it in my materials, but with it, it's American Builders and something company, and they're the, the ones that typically bring it and they they look um, you know for there are certain test cases and a 326 million dollar bond referendum is a test case yeah and I wrote that down that you said test case because I was trying to do some research to <coughs> see what other districts have entered into PLAs and um, I found the one about Minneapolis I saw Forest Lake has done one recently as well um, Roseville just the Roseville Mount too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Farmington did reject one recently as well and our St. Paul Maple with Egan Farmington well. rejected one a while ago I can't remember it was a few Sorry. years, but not too far. Yep. Can I can I just clarify something as you're asking this next question? She asked you where you got the seventy percent. Can you tell her where you got? The yeah, I got that seventy percent out of a statistic in the lawsuit against the Minneapolis school district From and the ABC. The, and the union did not contest that number. By the way, mm -hmm. they never contested that number anywhere in their materials. They they made arguments, other arguments, but they never contested that. And I was. The exact number is 70, I'll get you the exact number that was put in the materials. Um, I believe it was 71% is what they said. So again, for whatever you, those are the arguments that were made. That was not a position that was disputed by the Minneapolis Building and Trades Council. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's less than half. I mean, it's significantly less than half. So we're talking about, right, okay. Because, and the reason I'm asking you about being sued is that if we have this, you know, this huge bond referendum um, they might see it as a test case and that insurance won't cover our litigation. Do we know that our insurance doesn't cover the litigation? Yeah, that's that question. I would be highly confident in telling you that it's, that it's very, very unlikely <laughs> because it's a contract dispute and it's a construction dispute. And we represent roughly half the school districts in the state and I have never 
seen a construction dispute covered by insurance. Do we know what it cost in, in Minneapolis public schools during their lawsuit? I don't. I mean, theirs didn't even go to, to court or anything, but. I don't know what they. So in, in your professional opinion, it's possible, highly. It's the I think it's likely you're likely. going to get a lawsuit. Again, I'm not gonna comment on, I think that in the final analysis, you would likely prevail given the current state of the law, but I can't say that for sure. Right, but yeah, so the reason I'm asking all these questions is I'm thinking about our timeline and I'm thinking about our students and I'm thinking about our, our, our teachers and our, and our community um, that I'm just, I'm just trying to understand that if, if we made this decision and then we were sued, how that would impact us financially, how that would impact our community trust. Um, because I'm trying to wrap my brain around um, why we would not continue with a bidding process like we have in the past. Because I looked up the last two that we approved in, in February for the roofing projects, I believe were both union companies. So it's not like we're not hiring union companies. We are. We're hiring union, we're hiring non-union. Um, your comment about small businesses made me think too that I, I'm trying to understand the benefit of signing a project labor agreement when we are already in a lower low bid process. And I know I, I wrote down, I took a lot of notes on all the reasons that you gave, but I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. So in I will just tell you what I view it as, the arguments as they play out, um, and you're free to reject or accept this. I view this as a societal um, benefit. Uh, the main argument is that for the project, in favor of the project labor agreement, no delay, um, labor peace and harmony, higher wages for employees and so forth. Again, how are those happening? That means you're paying more. That's the only way that can happen. That, that's not a, it's not a Mick making it up thing. That, there's only one way that can happen. And so um, it's a societal give. If you're thinking that that's, that societal benefit outweighs the other things that are there, then folks will do that, project labor agreement. If you think that's the expectation of your community, then folks will do that, project labor agreement. If you think the expectation of the community is we're going to bid and go lowest responsible bidder and we're gonna include as many community groups and businesses as you can, then you might look at not going project labor agreement. So in every community, I don't have my finger on the pulse of your community like you do. Every community is gonna have a different sense, but that's for you to decide. That's why I was saying ultimately you gotta weigh that out and say, where is this community gonna come back? And without a doubt, someone's gonna be unhappy. The question is, what's the expectation as a whole? There's gotta be vocal minorities on both sides or vocal groups on both sides. What's the expectation of them? as a whole of your community. Mr. Javitt. Mick, um, has there any, ever been, to your knowledge, a class action lawsuit in a case like this against a school district or a municipality? No, you know, the closest we had was the, re the Minneapolis one, and but there were some missteps there, and I don't want to go through them all because I don't want to say how to, to create it, but. I believe that they had, in that case, a number, ABC was essentially representing a number of folks who were potential bidders. But one of the problems, there are a couple problems in that, they, none of them actually tried to go and go through the bid process, so they couldn't say they actually got their, their hands dirty, if you will. They didn't have standing to challenge it. Um, but that was kind of the closest that we saw. There is a lawsuit, um, I think it's out of Pittsburgh that's going forward right now, but that's on a slightly different basis. They have a different bid law in Pittsburgh than we do here, and so I think that's the main thrust of that challenge. Uh, and there are multiple um, prospective bidders who are part of that as well. Didn't that one just recently get let go, Mick? I'm not aware that it did. If it did, I'm not aware of that. But I, again, I know that the thrust of that was under their state bid law versus, you know, it's resolved in Minnesota that you can do it under our bid law. Um, but it was the Pennsylvania bid law that they were looking at there. Ms. Boy, no, that'd be Mr. Kavanaugh. What's that? Ms. Boy. Oh, uh, so say we do a PLA and whatever group decides that they're going to bring a lawsuit, does that stop construction? No. Probably not. Um, it's not 
the law, again, this is a developing area of the law, um, but probably not. Usually what courts will say is that in order to stop construction, you have to put up a hefty bond, uh, surety bond, to make sure that nobody's hurt. And courts don't like to do, you know, they don't like to halt the process, especially for schools. They really don't. So probably not. That was the best answer I can give you. Yeah. And again, I, I believe that based on existing law, you probably prevail, even if you go with a project labor agreement. Um, it's just that I can't tell you you do because the law is not well developed in that area. What I can tell you is I think a lawsuit's likely, and you're, I think you're going to have to pay for it out of pocket. But um, again, right now, based on the current law, I, I do think you probably prevail. Can I one more? Sure. Uh, so what's the difference then if we're going to do PLA versus prevailing wage, if the prevailing wage is what we need to pay, why, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so the prevailing wage basically says that as all of your businesses in White Bear Lake who want to participate just have to pay at whatever that prevailing wage is, right? But under the project labor agreement, you have to actually abide by all the terms and conditions of employment for workers in that classification. So let's say you've got carpenters coming in. If carpenters get two 15 minute breaks and a 45 or 40 minute lunch and um, you know there's work rules in that collective bargaining agreement and there's um, the retirement benefits and there's you know whatever it is you got to follow that collective bargaining agreement as if it's yours. And that is a much more significant level than the prevailing wage. Yeah that's what I was wondering was the underlying what were the besides just the benefits yeah. and everything is the yeah so you think about for how they and is that included? I mean, is there like a template for PLAs that they mostly all look the same? They look very you... similar. So when you look at them, they look similar. But again, there, there are variations, like the union hall hiring variation, the, the authority of the exclusive representatives, so the trades council to make some decisions. Some of that changes from agreement to agreement. But the problem, you know, when you go across the country, a, prevail or excuse me, a PLA in California or New York is going to be vastly different than one here because the underlying collective bargaining agreements are going to have very different terms and conditions than what we're going to see here through your St. Paul Trades Council or your Minneapolis Trades Council. But the, the key is you got to comply with those underlying collective bargaining agreements for the employees in that classification as if it's your agreement. Mm -hmm. So just like if, if we jettisoned your teacher's collective bargaining agreement and said you're going to have to follow from this day for the rest of the project, you're going to have to follow Mounds views. That's sort of what it's like. Can we negotiate any of the? No. Yes, you can. You cannot negotiate the terms of the collective bargaining agreements. You can negotiate the terms of the prevail of the project labor agreement. It's a negotiable. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. The question, though, as I understood it, is can you negotiate the terms of the underlying collective bargaining agreements? The answer to that is I've never seen that done. No. But as the, the terms of the of uh, the of the project labor agreement, those are all negotiated terms. Like, could you put in a penalty clause? Could you? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, all of that stuff could be included in a PLA. Again, subject to your power to negotiate, sure. <coughs> Mr. Chapman and then Ms. Newmaster. Mick, getting back to a class, <clears throat> reading between the lines, basically, I just want to clarify what I thought you kind of said indirectly, and that is we could possibly be subject am I, to a class action in the state. I mean, there's nothing statutorily or case law at this point that would preclude there's nothing that would stop businesses that. and joining or banding together <clears throat> or citizen groups of uh, that were not happy to uh, file a class action against us. I, businesses in particular that you that would be bidding on the project. Um, if they did certain things, they could establish standing, I think. But citizens, I would argue, probably do not have a right to challenge it. There's not, to my knowledge, any basis for them to challenge a project labor agreement because the, um, the courts in Minnesota have said you can do it through a, um, a bid process. You can include a project labor agreement as a requirement of the bid process. So I don't believe a citizen could challenge it. Could they not argue that we were not acting in their best interest, malfeasance, or? Yeah. Not unless you had a conflict of interest. You know, okay. that, that they could go and that would, you know, that would void the entire contract. Uh, 
Um, but uh, short of that, I'm not aware of a basis for them, for a citizen to do that. I'm not. Okay. Dr. Newmaster. I'm listening to this, and then I'm thinking back to the fact that our district employs many different unions, and we respect the expertise of the people in the different unions, and we would be upset if someone who did not have the certification or the requirements for the position, whether it's the Boilermakers license or the teacher that's teaching the class or the bus driver that's driving, we would think that was totally reasonable. So I'm looking at that, you know, PLA sounds appealing and we all want everybody to have a good job and rights and benefits, but if we don't look at the fact that most of the people that work for this district are members of a union, I believe, isn't that the truth? As, as we settle contracts and things and we look at mutually organized and negotiated benefits, I don't think that's a negative or a scary thing. I guess that's what I'm saying. PLA sounds like it's almost as good. I don't know. Is the thing that, that we're discussing that we have this huge pile of money and the community wants us to spend it as, I don't want to say cheaply, but or mention any particular store you should shop at, but I mean, I'm a bargain hunter too. So they want us all to be bargain hunters rather than, than look at the jobs that, that we're hiring. And I guess that's, that's my question. That's the thing that gets, I mean, I was a teacher and I appreciated the support I had. And I have, and I don't know if that just, you know, means that I shouldn't weigh in on this, but I think a lot of us have family members who had good jobs because they were union jobs and they had requirements does that mean that I always felt if I hired somebody with a certification, they were good at what they did. They had a good job and they were responsible for the checklist and, and things like that at the end of the job. So, I mean, that's just my opinion. And maybe that disqualifies me to vote on this, but I'm listening to it and I don't know. I mean, we're supposed to be responsible for how we spend this massive amount of money but we also want the job done right, done well, done on time by people that are experts. And maybe you can get that elsewhere. I mean, I haven't hired many people in my life. So, I mean, that's just some of the questions I have spinning in my head. Ms. Ellison? Um, I wanted to kind of branch off of what Dr. Newmaster just said. Um, because I keep going back to some of the questions that you posed. What if a non-union provides higher wages? What about a small business? What if there's a lower pay but higher health contributions? Um, it feels like there's so many factors here that there's not that <clears throat> that opening it up to all the competitive bidders, whether they are union or not. And I'll just be upfront and say that I've never belonged to a union, but I'm an expert in the work that I do. And so I think that we need to consider that this is a really complicated issue and that I, I support unions, I love our teachers unions and all the other unions in our district, but I think we have to take this into consideration, the idea that there are a lot of factors that we might not know about in our community. What if there is a small company of painters, that it's a family? Um, and I, I guess I feel like I would be uncomfortable closing out a portion of our community. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation though because as someone who has never been union, this is really helpful for me to, to understand. Um, but I do think we really have to carefully consider the complexities of this issue. And, and I want to add too, I really do not believe this is a pro-union, anti-union issue. No, if I you don't use a PLA, Every union can still bid, every unionized shop can still bid on equal terms with every non-unionized shop. Everyone gets the same opportunity to submit the lowest responsible bid. They're all closed bids. There's no cheating. There's no peaking. <laughs> you know, we open them all up at the same time and the lowest responsible bidder gets the deal. So I, I would be very careful to, I, I want to make sure we're all, again, it's not a matter of union yes or union no. I wouldn't want that uh, by any means. I, I think that it's, Again, 
the lowest responsible bidder um, model versus a requirement to work through the exclusive representative. That's what you're really talking about here. Ms. Thompson? Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to start off by saying <coughs> we have a conflict of interest. I am an employee of the St. Paul Relief Trades Council, um, but I am only an employee of the council. And uh, a couple points. One, I would ask all of the board members to go on to the ABC's website and research what they stand for and who they support financially with their PAC fund contributions um, because it is very one-sided and the people that contribute to their PAC funds is also very one-sided. It is usually the owner or the CEO of the construction company that they are trying to um, push on us. They are the ones who come up with a 70% number when they sued the Minneapolis Building Trades under the guise that their contributions most, mostly, it says in the article, go towards one side of the political party. Their contributions 100% go to one side of the political party. They are currently fighting to stop prevailing wage in multiple states, um, including our own. They are against, um, there's a, there's a bill out there that is trying to prevent um, hazardous work sites. Basically, it's saying right now there's like no guarantee that um, apprentices who work on hazardous work sites have to be properly trained and have to have um, proper protection. And so there is a bill being brought forth, and I believe it's on the East Coast somewhere, um, that is trying to make it mandatory that those workers have to be protected and have to be properly trained and the company has to provide that for them. To me that says a lot about a company that would do something like that. As somebody who is a union member of um, the OPEIU Local 12, I am a granddaughter and a daughter and a great granddaughter of union um, laborers. I have um, it is, to me, the project labor agreement guarantees that we are equitable in our hiring practices for the work that will be done in our district. And um, by not, or by excluding, well, I guess, two things. Project labor agreements do not exclude anybody from bidding on the project. Everybody is allowed to bid on the project. Usually the ABC argues that that is not true because the companies who do not bid on a project labor agreement do not want to abide by the prevailing wage laws. That's just, that's just the truth of it. Um, they have not been able to stop project labor agreements from happening in other districts because the support that came to pass our bond referendum really, it came from everybody but the union members that live in our district worked really hard to pass that bond because they want to be involved in making sure that the work is done by skilled, qualified, well-paid laborers. Um, when I was at Lincoln, the last group I read to, there was a girl, I read a book called What Do You Do With An Idea? And at the end it says, what do you do with an idea? You change the world. So we talked about ideas and different ways that ideas have changed the world. And one second grader said, you know, pipes change the world. And I first was a little bit like, oh no, where are we going with this? Um, but she was talking about pipes that we build underground that bring clean water to our houses and things like that. A little girl in kindergarten who had her little 100 day crown on was very excited, raising her hand. And I, I let her speak and she said, my dad is a pipe fitter. For a kindergarten girl to know that her father is a pipe fitter, to me says that there is pride in that house that her father is a pipe fitter and I could imagine that her father would want to be a part of the great things that we can do with this money that we have and the PLA does not stop anybody from bidding on the project. I don't know if I have a conflict of interest or not as I'm only an employee, I don't have any stock in the company, I don't gain financially. The office doesn't gain financially. Um, it's a council. There is no money from any construction projects that funnel into our office. Um, but I would 
abstain from voting, I don't know, I would want to talk to you to make sure whatever I do in this situation doesn't cause the school board or the district any um, financial issues or lawsuits or anything of that nature. Um, but this company who is putting out all of these statistics and this information, uh, I would just ask everybody to research them and go on to their website and see what they stand for and who, now they do have workers. Um, I believe that workers that are not represented by a union don't have a strong of a voice. I have not received any letters or communications from anybody who works for a non-union company, which to me kind of says that they don't have a voice. Um, sometimes aren't allowed to have that voice. Um, it is something I, I feel very strongly about, just as a union person that to me, it's kind of like an attack where the union represents everybody and they don't disclude anybody from working on the job. All they say is if they work on the job, you must pay them all fair equal wages, whether they are a female, Hispanic, Native American, white, black, whatever it is. Uh, you could look at the water gremlin and what happened over there as an example of what happens when people are not represented by a union. I just kind of respond to a couple of things real quick. Um, just so we're, so you know that my information, I take my information from the original source. I'm holding the complaint in my hand on the Minneapolis case. And it is paragraph 44 in which the allegation is that the council contributed exclusively to candidates in the Minnesota DFL in the amount of $254,624. I'm sorry, that's the next, that's International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. But the allegation is exclusively contributed. So I'm not, I just want you to know I'm not making that up. I know there's articles out there, but I took it right from the complaint. Whether that's true or not, I can't tell you. That's how the complaint starts. That's how the lawsuit started. I don't know anything about ABC. I don't work with ABC. I don't work for ABC. No, I've never done anything that. along those lines. Um, and I, I don't think, again, that this is an issue of prevailing wage, because that's a different issue than a project labor agreement. A project labor agreement is a much more overarching kind of requirement, if you will. So, um, and I do think, though, that there is some sense, I personally believe that it would be not possible for many businesses to simply shift on the fly from what their current structure of pay, benefits, and so forth is to complying with the terms and conditions of employment set forth in a collective bargaining agreement that's required under a project labor agreement. And that's, I do believe that's reality. And if you look at these cases, the allegation over and over again is, show us a single non-unionized shop that's done it. And so there, there's arguments back and forth on both sides of this. I don't, I'm not gonna get into that, but I do think that that point, there is validity to that one point, that imagine if you're running a business and you know, I just give you the example, even your business, which is you know, in the world pretty big, pretty powerful, you can't just drop everything and turn around and do what Malinsky is doing. You couldn't do it. I can't, in a business with 16 attorneys and su plus support staff, just turn around and do what another business does. Because everything is crafted and developed based upon you know, how each organization operates. And so I think that there is a real impediment there to the thinking that your local folks are just going to go forward and do that. Does that mean you should do a project labor agreement or you shouldn't? It doesn't. But I think the reality is there is a significant impediment there. Ms. Ellison. Um, because when I'm struggling with these types of things, I always want to go to the facts. I looked to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a United States government institution, which in 2019 said that union members accounted for 13.7% of wage and salary workers in Minnesota compared with 15% in 2018. So I think we can, we can talk about where these numbers come from, but I think that ultimately, I wanna be clear that I am pro-union, but I think we have to be careful that we are looking at facts. We are sticking with what is gonna be best for this district, this community, and I, I'm worried, just based on what I've read today, like I spent hours at work trying to figure out what to find online, it is emotional on both sides. And so I appreciate the legal perspective and the more we can stick to what are the facts, I think the better off that our community is gonna be. So I think 
I think there's a, a lot of emotion already starting to move. Um, I would ask us, and I would look to you, Wayne, to, excuse me, Dr. Kazrachek, to kind of talk us through where you're thinking the next steps should really go. Um, it sounds to me like we need to continue this conversation and set out some time um, at the next work study, or I think you need <clears throat> to kind of give a little bit of direction if you don't mind uh, just kind of your thoughts I'm, I'm not closing the questions down I'm not trying I, I just want to start to think about those next steps of uh, the conversation I'm not talking about hey I think we need to put a vote on tomorrow or anything like that I, but I I think we need to let people uh, let board members kind of go back and kind of dig into some of the information in which they got Kind of think through that process bring another piece to where they are able to ask questions uh, and bring those questions forward um, and kind of move things through i think there needs to be a defined of if there are conflicts of interest and in where those are so that we can make sure that we're being respectful in that case i think there's just a lot of moving parts that need to be brought forward mr chapman um how quickly, and I guess a follow-up uh, to what Jim Mullen said, how quickly do we need to make a decision on this before it would start impacting our timeline? Well, we'll be bidding on the ALC project this spring. Next, in, next month in March or April? Uh, it'll probably be April. So we would need to, so that's actually yeah, a pretty tight timeline. I mean, we can still do that no matter what. And still move it through, well, I, but if this does not, this conversation does not need to stop us from moving ahead with the work that we have. I agree with that. So, okay. So then I would ask though, but is then, do we need to come up with, um, if we're going to bid it like we currently bid it, that would include a prevailing wage. You had talked about some sort of policy or something of that nature so yep. was that I would work yeah, that? And I, what I am what I would do is I would follow up with Nick there's been a lot of conversation tonight and uh, to come up with a strategy for me to come up with a strategy like right now on the spot I'm not asking to I understand that's unrealistic so I think what we Nick and I would follow up and we would determine where we go from here and it, it does sound like there's probably a, an additional conversation I think the first step is probably, as you suggested, is the conflict of interest determination, however that looks. Okay. And I would work with you to, to figure that out and then strategize on as to how we would uh, bring it back for, for resolution for the board. Can I just say, so, I'm not comfortable moving forward with anything until I know that the people who potentially have a conflict of interest are protected, so. Right, and that's the first step. That's what we're talking about. I'm saying. I think that's the first step in the process. The questionnaire that Nick was talking about? Yeah, I could develop a questionnaire or survey, or I could make phone calls to each of you, or I well, could- But I mean, in. even before we have additional conversations about this, because I don't- That's what I'm to, saying. Okay. Is right. that that needs to happen first, before we would then. And then, then the additional conversations should occur. And I'll provide that information to you in writing as well that I talked about as the follow-up to this meeting. And you know, I, I did try to frame this as the arguments on each side because ultimately, I don't know that you can say there's a right and a wrong. As I said earlier, I think it's a community. What's right for your community? And uh, you know that, I don't know that. This, isn't, this is your community. You've got to make that call. And um, you know, there's statistics, and I, one of my favorite lines is, I don't like to rely on statistics because 80% of all statistics are made up, including the one I just gave you. I just took a stats class. Yeah. So. <laughs> Dr. Newmaster had a comment. Just as I try, I live a very simple financial life. It's so neat. I look at this and think this is a humongous responsibility, but if I can see it in little pieces, it helps. So we've done many, many big bids before. Have we ever had a PLA before? No, not that I'm aware of. Not since I've been here. And with years. this humongous pile of money, we're still bidding it one piece at a time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So I just want to and I finish. And, and is there any other questions? I just want to make sure that. I, Can I just have a comment, Miss Thompson? I just want you to know that your information you gave tonight was very well put together, and I wasn't. If I came off attacking, I'm no, not at all. Not at all. So Mick, if you can just do me one favor, I have two comments before we can, and, and we'll ask that, but 
Um, the first comment is I just, if you can remind everybody about open meeting law and the laws around talking to, uh, amongst each other regarding the conversation, because I want to make sure we stay uh, inside of the law and don't get outside of the law. So if you can remind everybody inside of the memo that you're going to put forth, I would appreciate that. Yeah. I think it's important, right, just so that we make sure we move there. Um, the last comment that I, I want to make is that uh, uh, I know that the bear she bars had come out and I just wanted to uh, recognize the fact that it's school board appreciation week. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for all of your work uh, and for your service to the school board and the school district, especially to the community. So thank you all very much with that. Um, and with that, if there are no other comments, questions or concerns, I will entertain a moment to, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm getting tired too. I'll second that and we are adjourned. <laughs>